Major funding for these programs has been provided by grants from Chase Commercial Term Lending and m and Bank, Geneva Burns, Jean Tomasi and Webster, Capital One Bank, the Wickoff Group, New York Community Bank, Greenberg Trorug, Perfect Building Maintenance, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company. Additional funding is provided by grants from Aerial Property Advisors, AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Leumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CVRE, Colliers International NYC, Cushman and Wakefield, Customers Bank, CUNY TV Foundation, DDG, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, First Nationwide Title Insurance Agency, Flushing Bank, Friedman, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, Herrick Feinstein, Versha Hospitality Trust, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Chairman, USRealty.com, John Katsimides, Red Apple Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, New Banks, Newmark Grubnight Frank, People's United Bank, RBS Citizens Bank, SJP Properties, Sterling & Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Continuum Company, Urban American, and these friends. Each and every day, properties are being traded. Buy, people are buying, selling from all around the world. And, you know, the banks are financing it. And this, it's really in a, in a very unique time. And certain people think it's back to 2007. So today I've assembled a group of individuals from all different aspects of the residential market. My guests include Frank Korsakwensky, who is the Senior Executive Vice President at Flushing Bank, a banker. Josh Zegan, uh, who is the managing member and co-founder of Madison Realty Capital, a purchaser. Aaron Youngrice, who's probably the biggest investment sales broker today, who is the chairman and CEO of Rosewood Realty. And last but not least, John Costa, who is the executive vice president at People's United, a banker. So since you're buying, since you're, buy you're buying and selling and you're financing, are we back, in, we were just saying prior to the taping, do you see this as the high of 2006, 2007, or have we exceeded it because cap rates are going over there? Is money at, at the levels that we've seen? What do you see, Josh? What do you think? And I, I think we're, you know, we were just saying, are we like 04, 05, or 06, 07? And I think in 04, 05, we're just coming out of a recession, um, and job growth just started to come about at that period of time, and you just start to feel that momentum in the market. And the truth is, right now, I think that that is more, it's more like 0405 than 0607. Um, the heat in the market just really started to happen in the last few months. Um, you know, financing just came back in a, in a way for more value add opportunities rather than just the stabilized stuff. So I, I, I do believe we're more like that than, you know, the 0607. What, what do you see if the compliment on Josh's comment about the value added financing? What do you see, Frank? It was a big play in, in the value-added financing. Uh, I think from a banking standpoint, um, the, the equity component is a driving force from our side uh, in order to get to that value-added transaction. Um, one of the things that we haven't seen yet coming to the marketplace that may push us past 0405 is uh, the uh, accelerated growth in the CMBS market. I thought I read somewhere that could be like an $800 billion market this year. I, I mean, uh, if you remember two years ago, it was a $120 million market to go to $800 million. And when, when Wall Street gets into it, they, they forget underwriting criteria. They, they change the rules a little. Yeah, well, uh, the, the height was, I think it was $270 billion or something like that in 07. 
Um, I don't know what it was last year, but it was maybe 60 billion. Maybe this year they're projecting 80 to 100. I, I don't know the exact numbers, but it's nothing near what it was. No, the CMBS market seven. hasn't returned. But what about the banking market? I mean, everybody, as we were talking prior to the show and in general, all the banks and more banks are coming into the market today, right? It's it's almost. I mean, you, you came in from Connecticut too, so. Well, I was here, but yes, we came in. From Flushing's Connecticut. been here a long time. You know? I've been here a long time, just in diff wearing different hats. Okay, uh, but I I worry that we're back, heading towards 06 and 07, at least from a finance perspective, because we already see compression in pricing on stabilized properties. And the next thing to give traditionally is structure. And we're now seeing where structure is weakening. So we're worried about covenants. We're worried about excess proceeds. Can we get taken out at maturity? Every deal we do, we're looking at the back end. Can I get refinanced out when the loan matures? And we're beginning to, to be concerned. And we're shying away from some transactions, not because the math doesn't look good today, but five years out, seven years out, we're saying, can this, is this sustainable? I mean, a function of interest rate risk. That's the number one. No, no one knows when that's going to creep into the system or, or accelerate, um, but that's really, is it a year, is it six months, is it three years? And that's what's driving the refinancing risk, I guess. In we, don't, we don't underwrite the current rates. Right. We use underwriting for it. And that, that and compresses what we can lend constant to. Constant or whatever else. How do you look at that underwriting risk? Um, we're pretty much in the same uh, picture as John. We're, we're very concerned about uh, trying to predict what's going to be happening in year six and year seven. Um, it's easy to do mathematically. We, you know, we stress the interest rate up as high as six and a half percent. We said a, uh, we'd like to see the deals we underwrite today have a, uh, a, a stabilized debt coverage ratio at that level, somewhere around a 130, uh, which actually makes it very conservative in today's market, but it gives you some assurance that there are some legs in the transaction in year six or year seven. But what it, you have a very difficult time is trying to understand where the expenses are going. Um, oil, uh, taxes, uh, insurance. So although you can model yeah, some, you know, some I, number. I, I think what you're saying about expenses, when people are looking at properties, okay, Aaron, you're selling them. How are they looking at expenses? I mean, first of all, I want to comment on what you had said before. I don't see the banks offering 90% LTV like it was in 06, 07. It's still 75%. I still mm -hmm. have a lot of guys who are buying with 50% equity, and rates are so low. So the guys who are, they're not putting on high leverage. I don't, I don't agree. I think we still have a few more years left to this amazing market. And the guys who are looking at the expenses, you got the fuel, which everyone's putting gas boilers in. So they're saving 30 40% on the fuel. The taxes, you can't do anything about. But the repair and maintenance, people are getting supers who know how to do the repairs. So they're, they're knocking that down by at least 25% on the apartment renovations. And also the income is going up. In Brooklyn, uh, bro people want to be in Brooklyn because they think it's the next Manhattan. People want to be in Manhattan because it's the dream. People want to go to the Bronx because at least in the Bronx, even though there's not a big rental growth, you're getting a real return. And people want to go to Queens because it's safe. And, and we're in New York. Wait a second. I, I but, hear one borough. Uh, what about Staten Island? There are some apartment houses. There are. Like there are. We're actually selling. Do you have any? Do you have any uh, we have a small exposure. Uh, I think the way we gain most of our traction, since it's mostly a residential uh, environment, is in the four and five family building marketplace. In Staten Island. In Staten Island. Any of the uh, traditional apartment complexes are up near the ferry docks, which has improved a little bit. They've got uh, some of the city housing up there. And you're scattered on the south side with some. Um, garden apartment complexes, and the rest in the middle is, is two and three family homes. Aren't you involved with Staten Island yeah, these well, days? Yeah, we own a number of properties in Staten Island that we acquired through uh, debt purchases. And, uh, you know, the market, at least in the sort of tip of the, the, the island near uh, the ferry, is really on, on, on fire in terms of development activity. Uh, the Outwood Centers were announced and approved, uh, the Ferris Wheel, um, some housing by, I believe it's uh, Iron State, some new apartments being built. Uh, we're getting 31 to 32 dollar foot rents on the water there. Uh, pretty, you know, pretty good numbers, relatively speaking, for what you can get there versus a Brooklyn or a, you know, Queens waterfront. Yeah, the the negative of Staten Island is is the commute. I mean, right. it's not that you can't commute it. <clears throat> it's a it's a larger commute. And I remember when my wife was in the employment business, many of the people who worked in Staten Island would traditionally work in Lower Manhattan right. because of the convenience, you know, for the transportation, Sorry. for the ferry, and everything else. But what about investment sales? Your investment business has been literally <coughs> on fire. Yes. And at, at prices, I mean, 
you know, at one time you could buy a, an apartment unit, you know, when you're talking under $200,000. I mean, today you can't see that. Today in Manhattan, there are some deals that are going for six, seven hundred thousand a unit. In Brooklyn, at least two hundred thousand a unit. Sometimes now even three hundred thousand a unit. Uh, the guys who are buying also are, are sophisticated buyers. You know, they're they're buying with some people are buying with hedge funds, but not the hedge fund money. The guy who owns the hedge fund is putting in the equity. Right. That was one of family your friends. Office, kind of. Right. No, the yes. no family office, and you know, they're they're the young executives who've made money on their bonuses, and they've said. You know, I don't, uh, I mean, I'm in the market anyway. I don't want to really be in that market, so I want to take that money. They literally, they literally want to hedge their money, and that's why they're going into real estate, and they are funding a lot of guys. There's no red tape. You don't have to go to a committee. Hey, John, I have this deal. I need $20 million. Yeah, they really are writing checks. They like call that. a couple of friends, yeah, and, they, and exactly. they put the deals yeah. together. Uh, when you see deals today, how conservative are the borrowers? I mean, I mean, as we were saying prior to the show, a lot of the business that comes to the traditional banks over here are broker-driven mm -hmm. here. Uh, have the brokers become uh, more realistic as opposed to pushing, as one would say conservatively, the envelope? They, they don't get paid if they don't push the envelope. So. <laughs> no, no, no. But, you know, you can push the envelope to a point <clears throat> if it's reasonable underwriting. That's more of what well, I, I think the... Um, many of the brokers that are around today are the ones that survived some very, very difficult times. So I think they have a very keen knowledge of uh, how to deliver a package to John and myself for consideration. And they often quite understand the nuances between many different banks. So I think they're more selective when they need to place certain types of transactions. And there's a challenge that they have, though, too, which is a challenge that I think we're all facing, which is there's a disconnect between loan-to-value and financing on cash flow. And we're cash Absolutely. flow lenders. So you and you're a cash flow. You see a right? lot of constraint. It's, you know, Absolutely. Seventy-five percent of the value is an interesting thing. But when I look at the cash flow in our unstabilized building and I work the numbers we have to work, you don't get the seventy-five percent loan to value that easily. Not on in New York, at least, because everything is debt service constrained. Yeah. Um, given you're buying rent stabilized housing at a three cap, four cap, you know. Wh so, whatever. So, 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 but you're buying. You, you're buying a lot. So why? Wh what are you buying, and wh wh how do you see this? You know, uh, you're a good customer of Aaron. So how do you see the market? Typically, I mean, we're buying things that have additional upside from either family ownership that have owned for many years and uh, haven't maximized value three, through reconfiguring units, uh, air rights, uh, retending retail. Uh, There's all, all different ways of using existing square footage and putting capital into uh, upside rents. Are any, you know, basically with the new administration, how is that having an effect uh, on the the buyers and the sellers today, because uh, as I said, I was at the chip event, the uh, community housing, and I ran into some people when we were talking about that portfolio that you and I talked about. And one person said, you know, when the regulations may change, there may be different rules and regulations on how you can get increases in rents and other situations, which is very important as a banker. So I long mean, as the rent regulations stay where they are, whether it's a 4.5% or 6% or even 2%, it'll be fine. If a rent freeze, which is something that de Blasio mentioned, which I don't think will come to play, if that actually happens, then there will definitely be a severe correction. I don't think it's going to happen. I really think that would be pandemonium. No way it could happen. One of the other things that's happening in New York State is um, the Department of Financial Services has come out with some policies. Policies. I'm not so sure if you're familiar with them with respect to... Um, banks financing apartment buildings and applying for CRA credit. Right. Um, they are, have a pending legislation that have very specific requirements about violations in buildings. So that's going to put uh, a little bit of a bad flavor into certain investors who aren't attentive to the paperwork, uh, particularly with building violations. Mm -hmm. So that, that could be a little bit of a turnoff as well, but I, that's probably a post-election issue. You know, well, that's an in interesting matter, <clears throat> and it, it relates to a buyer, seller, and a lender. When, when you, uh, and I know this when I've seen underwriting reports, especially from New York Community Bank, within the write-up, it always talks about the number of violations <coughs> and number of units over there. As a seller, how do you look at it? Uh, when, you, when, when you're representing a seller and say, I got a building, they don't bring up the subject of violations, do they? Never. Never. It's never an issue, unless there's a severe... A uh, case of rent impairing violations. Otherwise, everyone takes it with the A's and the B's, even the C's, and the banks rarely escrow. 
the, the biggest issue you're seeing actually as a seller right now is people are scrutinizing how units were deregulated. So a lot of times, like, they want to make sure if it's a free market unit, the proper dollars were put in to deregulate the unit. And because there are a number of sort of, I think there's a lot of inexperienced buyers out there right now, a lot of them are relying on their lawyers and, you know, not necessarily, um, that, that's one of the things that I'm seeing. In every transaction where I'm a seller, it's everyone scrutinizing whether buyer or seller. Um, but that's an interesting discussion with regard to J51s and deregulated apartments. How do you as bankers look at this? The J-51 is a great program, but there really isn't a lot of that money around any longer. So um, anything no, no, that's if, come on. If, if the property was a J-51. Deregulating a J-51. Deregulated J-51 that they, that they had tax benefits before. How do you look at that? We're, we're looking that right now. They, those transactions are probably nearing the seventh year of the abatement, and then they'll start um, increasing in taxes. So we generally look to be within a framework of... Uh, a tax expense of somewhere, depending on the property, between 10% of uh, the current income to 15%. On a 15% side, it would probably be Manhattan, where taxes as a percentage of rent are generally higher than they are in, in Brooklyn or the Bronx. It doesn't necessarily preclude us from doing a loan, but it's sort of a, a reality check because these newer buildings are at market rents already, and if there's any slippage in the future, uh, you want to make sure that the buildings can sustain that tax increase five or six years out. So we're not really focused on the past yet because most of these things are winding down with the J-51, but when we get something in that's towards the end, we're underwriting full taxes. Yeah. We're, not take, we're not hedging the bet. We're going with full tax burden. What we're seeing a lot of is 421As that are coming through where we're just they're cycling their, through They're them. 10th or 15th. Right. Uh, th yeah. Those are, <coughs> that, uh, you know, for my audience, you know, this was a tax abatement program, <coughs> you know, uh, over a 10-year phase in or a 15-year phase in. Then the taxes are full taxes, which really has, a, has an effect on the situation. And I assume that you have some sellers who are selling because Absolutely. of the 420 Because the 420A is expiring in six, seven years. It's going to start creeping in, and the rents are very high. There's no more room to grow. So ultimately, the expenses are going to go higher than the rents So he, will. here's a question. What's the nature of the buyers today? The buyers are either funds, families, or people who are raising money from funds. Okay, when we're talking about funds, because, you know, when we discussed 2006, 2007, then we had a lot of funds buying who really wanted to get rid of people, you know, in their apartments, and then if, if they had anything involved with the city, they, they, those funds, the old funds aren't there. I mean, no. the area is no longer no. there, you know, all those old funds aren't there. So what type of funds are buying today? What type of uh, you were saying Chinese groups, you know, what, what? Some foreign groups, some regular equity funds that are based in New York or in the U.S. Also, they've limited their returns now. They don't have that expectation, which they had in 06, 07. That's why I think also there's a lot of room to the market. They're much more patient. They're going for seven to ten year plans, and they don't need a return right away. Who do you see as your major competition today? There are, <coughs> there are groups sort of that are backed by other private equity funds going out and buying typical value-add, multifamily, mixed-use retail. I mean, that, that's who we're... What about neighborhoods? I mean, you, Frank and I were talking before the show with regard to, you know, when peop many people say there's no bad neighborhood in New York, but it's, I think it's a question of neighborhood and commutation, right? That's, Absolutely. That, that's the situation, you know, as, as I would say, since I'm older than the two of you, the, the, the question was, and you, you know, you live in the five towns, so people wouldn't go to the Rockaways because it was a two-fair zone. It was a, you know, a two-fair zone and not only literally two fairs, it took too long to get over there today, and which is part of the reason why people, including myself, don't believe that Coney Island resurrection is going to take place because it is an hour on the train and then you have to take a bus or something like that. That's the problem. When I explain the geography to some, some of my committee members, we always talk about how close is it to the nearest subway station and how the gentrification is migrating outwards from subway stations. So as long as you can be on a, on a reasonable commute, one fare zone on a subway, it's pretty interesting to look at. I'd say it's, uh, we subscribe to the same philosophy, and, and particularly if you look at Bushwick, how uh, the direct J and the M lines right into Manhattan have really had a tremendous impact, not, not to mention 
uh, the value that you can add uh, in your re uh, rental space by moving that way. But uh, it's no different than it was at the turn of the century. They built the railroads to, to uh, help these neighborhoods. Somehow along the way, we got away from it, and people started to move to the suburbs, but the suburbs are coming back to the city. But interestingly enough, uh, when you talk about Coney Island, it may not have the same um, allure that uh, Brooklyn has to uh, younger individuals coming to New York City for the first time. It does have a, a very strong appeal to uh, a European uh, culture that's coming to the United that's States. That's part of it. I'd say that's <coughs> more, and you, you've done a lot of sales, the Brighton Beach is more of the Russian community or, or the immigrant community. Right. And it may be a, com it may be a large, long commute, but some of these people are working in that community, first of all, and second of all, that's where their families are. So they want to be there because of that situation. And you, and you also have that uh, with the Bukharians and the Asians, large Asian population in, in, in Queens. Right. I mean, the flushing over there, there's no question. Absolutely. Uh, Brighton Beach, a lot of people who are buying there live in the neighboring areas, whether it's in Midwood or Kings Highway area and they're buying and their kids are buying with them. It's a very uh, neighborhood type feel over there. The guys who are buying in Brighton are not coming from Manhattan. They're Brooklyn guys. So he, here's a question that we, we, br we bring up. You know, rates are down. Uh, Yellen <coughs> spoke the other day and everybody got scared because the Treasury bills rate went up. You know, no, I would say no one sitting in this room ever believed that we would have 3% money for the last year, a year and a half uh, this long. I remember uh, one of my good friends off here, Denny, screaming at me, says, you told me to lock in at four and a quarter. I said, I thought it was a good rate. He says, now I can be at three. Uh, rates have to go up. None of us have, including me with my apple over here, my shiny apple, to figure out when it's going to be. But what happens when rates go up? How does that have an effect on the entire residential market, Frank? I think from a leverage standpoint, it will definitely uh, cool off the valuations. Um, obviously, uh, the less you can borrow, um, the less likely you'll be able to pay more for a particular building. But that, that's somewhat long term. Um, I think that uh, <clears throat> most of the buyers that we, uh, are not buying today, if they see the uh, prices cooling off, I think they will be a little bit more excited about not purchasing um, at levels of eight, nine, or ten times rent. And there's two interesting uh, stereotypes that we talk about in real estate now, and, and we're experiencing two uh, spectrums here. One being our traditional borrower who doesn't want to pay more than five times rent on a building because they think that they'll never make any money at it because they bought their buildings at two times rent. And there is the younger, uh, successful business type that's partnering with uh, other types of uh, professional investors who really don't want to get dirty and are working with uh, investors who have been in the, on the street for many, many years and partnering up with their experience. Uh, money's come in, as we mentioned earlier, from uh, successful Wall Street type people and the fellow who's managing the property on Main Street is getting a smaller ownership interest than running the book on it. That person who's younger and is on the street is willing to pay more for that particular building because they know the ins and outs and the other patient investor will wait for the price to go up. Um, but if prices come down, I think there's a significant uh, portion of our customer base who will jump back in the market. As rates go up, you're going to see the refinance market slow down. It'll be harder for people to, you know, typically we see the refinance cycle <coughs> three to five years. It'll be harder for the traditional owners to refinance, take money out, expand their portfolios and do things. You're going to see a slowdown on that more traditional business, I think. Here's a question that I didn't bring up. You know, People were very interested in, in purchasing multifamily because the interest rate and the, what it cost you in interest rate and what you could earn in the, in the bank was, the, was negligible. The stock market has improved. So certain people who may have not been investing, who were investing in real estate, may, uh, may want to go now into the stock market because it had a higher appreciation last year per value, you know, <coughs> in a perceived index. Do you see that possibly? No, I don't. I think there's still a, a thirst for real estate. People want to touch it. They want to feel it. Everyone I know who's doing well wants to go into real estate. And the guys who are raising money are getting all types of investors. And they, they don't know the stock market. Only the mavens who know it are, are in there. And, and obviously, it's doing great, the stock market. But for the guys like me who don't know it, 
they just keep staying in real estate. Re relating to that question, uh, you know, a number of years ago, I was totally surprised when Amco, you know, a Denver-based REIT, came in and bought walk-up apartment buildings in, in New York City. I mean, Equity came in and bought a p large apartment houses. Do you see, you know, because there are other REITs, do you, do you see these REITs, I mean, like the Amco or other REITs, uh, like American Capital Partners, Nick Scorch's uh, thing, coming into this market and possibly uh, once again saying, you know, I want to, you know, it's not a bad idea for us to have this as apartment REITs? The walk-ups, no. They still can't get used to the cap rates. It's very hard for them to get used to it. Um, so I don't see them coming in. I see them. Have, have you, has Peoples or even from <coughs> your old days at Sovereign, had you provided financing for the REITs? Not on the walk-up sector, no. What we saw was them coming in with, with more significant purchases and, and being able to rationalize it. Just yeah, because there are a number of buildings I, that I still walk around the city and I see these little signs with Amco and I'm totally shocked on the Upper West Side, you know, not the Upper Upper West Side, but on the West Side, that these properties are owned, um, are, are, are owned by these REITs. It could be residual product that, the, that they've held in their portfolio. I a mean, number of firms did, did get burnt early on, uh, post-2007, by overpaying. And maybe it was a product of the, uh, uh, the anticipated returns that they weren't getting and moving out very quickly. They took some lumps in that market. Right. And so, so, so here's a question. Which it, it's not talking about the current market. We're talking about the, the price per, for land. I mean, people had, you know, you, you do mostly office sales, I mean, residential office. sales. But land prices, have you seen this? Could you believe the land prices, Josh? No, I mean, a lot of it's driven by the, con at least in Manhattan, driven by the condo market, and everyone thinks they can sell 3,000-foot condos, so because of that, whether it's mid-block or on but, the but avenue, it, I, But it's also, you thinks. know, I was talking to my friend Tom Lydon, who said to me uh, about six years ago at the City Investment Fund, they were in contract for a property on 4th Avenue in Brooklyn, in the, not Sunset Park neighborhood, whatever we'll call it, and he said, I was in contract for a buck 25 or a buck a hundred dollars a foot, and now that that land is selling for two fifty a foot, so that's not condos. No, that, that's that's not rental. condos going for uh, for three thousand dollars a foot. But that's driven by Park Slope hitting fifty five to sixty dollar foot rents versus then thirty to forty dollar foot rents. So I mean that's why I mean markets like Crown Heights land prices have gone up like crazy. Clinton Hill, you know, we paid ninety bucks a foot on Myrtle Ave uh, next to Pratt. A year and a half ago, that land goes for 250 to 280 a foot today. So, yeah, clearly. And, and, and as bankers, will you lend on land? No. We would do a transaction for an existing relationship, n not so much uh, on a, uh, a new relationship. Um, but I will say, uh, I've seen considerable activity, even with the small land portfolio that we have. There are customers who thought you might have a difficult time holding on to their property seven years after the peak, have been able to recapitalize, uh, willingly um, provide equity and, and certain other, other covenants that you'd like to see to renew the loans for a period of time uh, that you didn't see two years ago. Um, and some of it's in Staten Island. Uh, some of it uh, is a little bit outside of Jersey City. Um, you know, there's just a lot of money out there and, and people are kind of lining up for the next the next phase uh, of development. So in summation, you know, uh, I'm, I'm thinking that I'm listening, I'm becoming positive to Aaron that this situation is going to continue for a, uh, a period of time, and hopefully it will, and hopefully the banks uh, are prudent and they don't uh, provide, uh, and I know you guys, I don't have to worry about being prudent. I know you're going to look after it that way. And the market looks positive. And as long as the economy and people come to New York to uh, rent apartments, buy apartments, it's going to be good. I'd like to thank Frank, uh, Josh, uh, Aaron, and John, and I'll see you next week.